Hello everybody, uh, it's Paul Beckwith. Uh, Happy New Year. I'm at a little park uh, in Ottawa, directly across from the uh, Ottawa City Hall uh, behind me there. And uh, I'll just give you a little view here of my where I am. We, we're having a little bit of a snowstorm here. Uh, maybe 30 centimeters or so by the time it's all over, 30. Yeah, something like that. So about a foot of snow for uh, Americans not using the metric system and 30 centimeters for everybody else in the world. So what I want to, I want to reflect on the report that has just, I'm being bombarded by snow from the trees, but that's okay. I want to talk about the uh, news that has just come out that um, we've set a 2020 global temperature record. So the average global temperature on the earth, which is obtained by taking uh, numerous stations, both on the land and ocean and interpolating in between it and coming up with a number. Now, of course, this type of number is difficult to derive. So there's a whole bunch of different groups that do it. There's a group in Japan, there's uh, NASA, of course, uh, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration number. There's the GIS uh, NASA number, which is the GIS is G-I-S-S, Goddard Institute of Space Science. Okay, there's a European one. There's all kinds of numbers, but uh, here we are in the middle of January, 2021, and there's some sort of consensus on the number. And basically it's that the global average temperature exceeds the turn of the century, last century. So 1900, basically, bracketed by about 10, 15 years on either side to, to get a 30 year climatological, so-called climatological average. And the, the change in temperature from then is about 1.25 degrees Celsius. And that is higher, so this sets a new record. It's higher than the 2016 number. Now in 2016, there was a powerful El Nino, which elevated the global temperature about 0.3 degrees or so that year. In uh, the so-called ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation Climate Variability Event, when there's an El Nino, it elevates the global temperature, you know, about uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. And uh, when there's a La Nina, they're not quite as powerful. It's a, it, the average global temperature is lower by about 0.1 degrees Celsius. And the reason for this is the is uh, heat in the ocean. So in El Nino years, there's lots of heat that comes out of the ocean um, into the atmosphere. And of course, when we talk about global average temperatures, we're talking about the, the air temperature at the surface or actually just a couple meters above the uh, surface. Okay, so so in, so what is, but it's very surprising that 2020 set a new record since we've been uh, living under the coronavirus and global emissions are lower. So global emissions have been lower by about six or 7%. You know, some countries much higher, some less, but the global average is about six or 7%. Yet the CO2 level in the atmosphere, the concentration still increased uh, significantly over 2.5 uh, parts per million. Okay, so, um, you know, if you add 7% to 2.5, you know, you can figure out what it would have been if we hadn't been in the shutdown. So the shutdown did have an effect, a measurable effect, but obviously not a huge effect. And it gives you an idea of the uh, scale of the problem to address this. Now, let's uh, talk about that 1.25 degrees Celsius above the, the 1900 baseline, actually 1880 to 1910 or 1890 to 1920, that baseline, because there's a huge misnomer out there. And I've talked about this before, the misnomer, the idea of shifting baselines. When that two degrees Celsius guardrail was put in place, the safe temperature rise guardrail in the Paris Climate Conference in 2015, that two degrees number was talked about a lot, but also a 1.5 degree 
aspirational number was put into place. I want to remind you that those numbers, when those numbers were first used, they were relative to the year 1750. And the year 1750 was termed pre-industrial, okay? So when you talked about temperature rise since pre-industrial, it always referenced, it always was relative to that 1750 number. But now, today, when people talk about relative to pre-industrial, they almost always assume and say that it was the 1900 number. Now, this is hugely problematic. This is actually cheating or fraudulent. Um, the, so basically, the temperature, the global average temperature, to the best of our knowledge from proxy data, increased between 1750 and the 1900 average, bracketed average, by 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. So the temperature in 2020 that we set is actually 1.25 plus 0 0.3, which is 1.55 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, pre-industrial being the 1750 year. Now, this would happen in a La Nina year, a weak La Nina. Without that La Nina occurring, 2020's temperature would have been 1.55 plus 0 0.1 or 1.65 degrees Celsius. If 2020 had been an El Nino year, like in 2016 when the previous record was set, we would need to add 0.2 degrees onto that 1.65 so we would have had 1.85 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial being 1750. Okay, so 1.85 was the number for last year. If there'd been an El Nino, if it had been a neutral year, it would have been 1.65. Because it was a La Nina year, it was 1.55, which is the 1.25 relative to 1900 plus the 0 0.3, which is 1.55. So you can see the significance of these numbers, okay? The previous record in 2016, like I say, if that had been a neutral year and not an El Nino year, you would have subtracted 0 0.2 from that and uh, that would have uh, not set a record, okay? so. When you hear anybody, any media, anybody talking about pre-industrial and the temperature being, you know, the 1.5 guardrail, well, we're gonna pass it soon. We're approaching the two. Just correct them. Talk, show them this video or discuss the numbers that I've talked about because it's very important. It's, it's absolutely absurd. We've already, I mean, in, the bottom line is We've already passed the 1.5 guardrail for the entire year of 2020, okay? We've been at 1.55 degrees Celsius. In a neutral year, that would have been 1.65, and in a La Nina year, that would have been 1.85 degrees Celsius. Within, a, within the next couple of years, we're almost certain to have another very powerful El Nino, and when that happens, then we will actually approach those 1.85 degrees Celsius type numbers that I'm talking about. So, you know, climate change has taken a bit of a back burner, uh, been a bit on the back burner in 2020, even though we've set records galore across the planet and, uh, and uh, extreme weather events have accelerated greatly and they're gonna going, to, going to continue to do so. Now also, you know, Okay, so, so that's, that's where we're at. We're actually 1.65, uh, 1.55 Celsius in 2020 above the year 1750. But of course, this is global temperature average. So there's huge differences between the land and the oceans. So where all people are living on land, the temperature is much, much higher than it is if you're living on the ocean or the ocean temperature, right? So most of you have already experienced global average temperatures higher than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. And the higher the, you go up in latitude, 
And the further you get away from moderating influences, moderating bodies of water like lakes and oceans, etc., the the hotter, the higher the temperature rise. Uh, so you know we're talking about continental climates being much more extreme than uh, coastal climates, right? I mean, I think that's pretty clear. The further up north you go, the higher the temperature rise. This is because of Arctic temperature amplification. The Arctic is losing so much sea ice and snow cover in the spring that it's a much darker place. Physically, it's much darker. It's not reflecting as much sunlight. How much? Well, if you, if you use it, depends on your definition of the Arctic. If you take anything north of about uh, 66 degrees latitude, the, global, the temperature is about three times higher than the global average. If you go up further and further north, the temperature is five times or even, you know, north of 75 degrees, it's more like uh, six or seven or eight times the, the warming is six, seven or eight times faster than the global average. Another effect on temperature is your elevation. Um, so higher, the higher the elevation, the larger the temperature rise that you're seeing. Okay, so if you live up at high in high altitude cities, like the Mile High City, you know, if you're thinking of Denver or some country, uh, cities like that, or if you're living, you know, in high regions near in uh, Asia in the Tibetan Plateau, the average global temp the temperature rise that you are experiencing is far higher than the global average temperature rise, far far higher. You know, two times, three times higher. So, so uh, two times, three times higher if you're on land, uh, which we all live on land versus, you know, that's what you'd experience. Two to three times higher if you go up in elevation and, uh, you know, three to eight times or four to eight times higher uh, if you live up uh, in the high latitude, high uh, latitude regions up towards the Arctic and also much, much higher if you go uh, down um, in the southern hemisphere, although not as much as in the northern hemisphere. So, of course, the, the key significance of all of these uneven, this, this uneven distribution of temperature rise um, in the, uh, you know, across the planet is the disruption of the jet streams. So, the temperature gradient or difference between lower latitudes and the Arctic are getting uh, reduced significantly because of the huge Arctic warming. So the jet streams are slowing down and becoming wavier and getting stuck in place. And we're getting these, uh, these powerful blocking patterns and that's giving us the extreme weather events that we're seeing. In a warmer planet, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere for every degree Celsius increase in temperature. There's about 7% more water vapor in the atmosphere. And water vapor, of course, is a powerful greenhouse gas. So this feedback is, is accelerating the warming. We're getting uh, more and more methane being uh, in, coming up from the permafrost and tundra in the Arctic as it is thawing. So permafrost thawing, there's a lot of organic matter in the permafrost and that's undergoing decomposition. And if it's near the surface and there's oxygen present, it's producing CO2. If it's uh, in a bog or marsh, so submerged, and there's not much oxygen present, then it's methane that is being produced. Also, the thawing of the permafrost and tundra is uh, causing sinkholes. It's causing methane outbursts from methane clathrates, which is basically a matrix of frozen water uh, surrounding the methane molecule. The frozen water uh, melts and the methane, the clathrate is released. And these clathrates on the ocean floor, there's vast amounts on the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf up in the Arctic. So as the water temperature is greatly rising, increasing, you know, five, six, seven degrees Celsius, all the way down from the surface to the uh, ocean floor in these, uh, uh, in these huge continental shelves up in the Arctic, the Eastern, Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf in particular, the, uh, perma the, the seafloor sediments are thawing and we're getting the class rates melting and releasing huge amounts of methane up into the atmosphere. 
So watch out. We're in for a wild ride. And thanks for listening.